Hello and God bless you, brothers and sisters. My name is Reverend Jared Reed Smith, and I'm a minister here at the Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church, where my pastor is Dr. Johnny Calvin Smith. Brothers and sisters, it brings me great joy to bring you your Sunday school lesson because we have been built upon a firm foundation, and we thank God for the Word of God. And I want to say that I thank God for each and every one of you that continue to join me each and every week for Sunday school. Truly, we thank God and give him all the glory for everything he continues to do for us. I want to say, brothers and sisters, that we want to invite you to the Mount Moriah Church. Please join us for morning worship. Sunday morning worship starts at 11 a.m. each and every Sunday. If you're not in a place where you can join us in person, please join us via our social media outlets. If you are able to join us, please know that we continue to follow safety guidelines. We are wearing our masks. We are checking our temperatures at the door and we are watching our distance. But our highest aim is to worship and play and praise our Lord and our Savior. Also, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., Finding Time with God. That is our adult Bible series where we are going through the word of God with our pastor, Dr. Smith. Please know that you can join us via our Zoom uh, link, which is in the description of this video. Or you can join us via live stream on our YouTube page. Please join us at 7 p.m. on Wednesday night for adult Bible study. If you'd like to be a blessing to the Mount Moriah Church as we are building a new edifice for the glory of God, please know that the link is in this, in this description and we will just be so appreciative for your love offering. Thank God for everything, brothers and sisters. Continue to pray for us as we continue to pray for you. Before we go any further, let's pray. Gracious God, we do say thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for everything. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you please bless this word like only you can. Lord, we pray that something will be said to be pleasing in your sight and edifying to your body. It's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, our lesson for today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll be reading from uh, chapter 11, verses 20 through 34. Our lesson topic is thoughts on the Lord's Supper. Now, not long after Paul founded the church in Corinth, he heard about, as we've been studying in the book of Corinthians, uh, there were some problems among uh, some of the believers there. These new Christians even sent Paul a letter with various questions. Their questions concerned marriage, eating meals offered to idols, worship, spiritual gifts, and even giving. Apparently, some of them thought that it was acceptable to participate in feast and Christian worship. Paul pointed to the Lord's Supper to rebuke this idea, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21. Then in chapter 11, the apostle even had to address the Corinthians' abuses of the Lord's Supper itself. Abuses of the Lord's Supper were only one of the several disorders in public worship that Paul sought to correct. He praised the Corinthians generally for keeping the words he had given them according to chapter 11, verse two. But he also made it clear that some of the things that they were doing were improper within the church. According to chapter 11, verses three through 16, their abuse of the Lord's Supper was so serious that Paul could not praise them concerning this matter. Instead of edifying the church, the Lord's Supper had become a hindrance to the growth and to the unity of the church would ultimately would cause divisions. Allow me to give you some insight on where our lesson is going to go. We're talking specifically about the Lord's Supper today and the Lord's Supper was usually a part of a meal that the Christians shared together. And so they call this the love feast. And you'll hear me talk about this uh, throughout the lesson. So in Corinth, instead of sharing their food and drinks, each family was bringing its own meal and eating what they had brought. And so the result was the rich had plenty, but the poor had little and were hungry and embarrassed. This was hardly a picture of Christian love and unity. Furthermore, some who had plenty of wine to drink were evidently drinking too uh, heavenly and got drunk. In short, they were eating their own private meals rather than sharing a meal consecrated to the Lord. And so that is kind of the background that you'll see. You know, we even talked last week about the Christian liberty 
and how, you know, just because things are okay, was doesn't mean that it's a license to do whatever you want to do. And so this is not necessarily the context, but I'm just saying what we realize is that love, it had to be the, the, the ground or the foundation of everything that we do within the church. And that was one of the things that Paul was trying to get the Corinthian believers to understand that love as a result of God and as a result of Jesus's finished work on the cross, that our service and everything we do needed to have a foundation of love. That's why he talked about in chapter eight, I believe it was, we talked about the knowledge or, or my, my knowledge is it puffeth me up, but charity edifies, it builds up. And so even when we get to chapter 13, uh, where he talks about uh, those things that now bideth, right? But but it's what, what is the greatest of those things is love. And now by this chapter 13, verse 13, and now by the faith, hope, and charity, which is love. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. He even says that even if I don't have love, it's just like sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. So I just want to kind of get a little background and now let's get into the lesson. So just a running commentary, verses 20 through 22, rebuke for selfishness. Verses 23 through 26, the body and the blood. Verses 27 through 34, self-examination. So let's go through this and we won't go too fast, but let's get through uh, with our verses today. Verse 20 says, when ye come together, therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So prideful divisions had so taken over the Corinthian church uh, that even uh, this disrupted the Lord's Supper. Instead of honoring Jesus Christ during the communion, the people turned it into a time of self-gratification. Because of this, Paul wrote, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He's stating a fact of what you all were doing. You're coming together for different purposes, right? Whatever the congregation's intentions might have been concerning communion, their behavior made it impossible to call this meal the Lord's in any sense. Verse 21, for in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. So in the early church, churches followed the, the Lord's example when he ate with his disciples. You know, when Jesus observed the communion, as it were, the Corinthian believers would gather for a common meal called the love feast, where members would bring food and share one with another. However, the wealthier members, as I stated earlier, normally brought more than they needed, but wouldn't share it with those who were not as uh, of, of fortunate. So at the same table, one could find those who were hungry for a lack of food and others uh, gorging themselves, uh, maybe even being gluttonous over the food that they had. So the Corinthians had made a uh, uh, just this this big thing into this love feast. This selfishness uh, reigned instead of the way that God or Jesus Christ rather would want it. Selfishness was uh, the, the foundation of their gathering. So not only were some people sitting at the table going hungry while others were definitely in need, but there was others that were getting drunk. Basically, they turned the Lord's Supper into a party. And just as the Lord followed his Passover meal by instituting his communion service, the Corinthians waited until their dinner was over to partake of the Lord's Supper. But there was no real fellowship or communion taking place throughout the entire love feast. They didn't show any love for one another, nor did they show reverence for Jesus Christ or his supper. So it was common uh, that when Jesus, he observed the Passover, right? And they had the meal, but there was something very special and unique. You know, Judas didn't take part of the Lord's Supper. Judas did not have any part of that for he had already been excused. Yes, I'll wash your feet. <laughs> I'll do that, but you're not gonna take part of this because this is special. And let me stop parenthetically and say this. Uh, thank you, Holy Spirit, for putting this on my mind is that we have to be careful when we're trying to be so relevant that we lose reverence for the Lord's Supper. Now, there's there's nothing 
Yeah, and, and you know, then this is open to opinion and everything like that. But I think everyone that understands what I'm trying to say, we we sometimes try to be so relevant uh, to the real world and what's going on that we lose. Uh, we it, it's at the expense of reverence to what we're really there for. I thank God for, and I can remember it just like there, just like any other time when I used to hear the old people used to say, "You need to draw in your wandering minds." Uh, you know, and they would tell us, and I can just hear it sends chills down my down my little arm right now because I can hear and I can hear them say that there was something special about the Lord's Supper. You shouldn't be, and you know, and I, I can't find this in the Bible, but there's a, there there is a thought of reverence that should be acceptable in our churches because we ought not have. I remember the old folks say, "Y'all not be chewing chewing gum." during the Lord's Supper. Now, I can't find that in the Bible, y'all. I can't find it in the Bible because chewing gum wasn't a, wasn't a thing back then. But I think what they were trying to get us to understand is there is a level of reverence that we should have. It's not about being showy. It's not about who can uh, get the biggest piece of bread or who can get the biggest cup. It's about reverencing what symbolically through this Lord's Supper, what Jesus did in the flesh for you and I, his body was broken. Blood came streaming down. This is not a joke. This is not a time for us to come together and laugh and play. And that's why I appreciate. And, and we need more. God knows we need more mature Christians to remind us to be reverent. We need reminders for our young people, for our old people alike, that we need to be reverent during the Lord's Supper. And I just got on my rant, so I'll move on. Verse 22, what? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Why are you doing this at this time? Don't you got houses that you can eat and get drunk in? Or despise ye uh, the church of God and shame them that have not? Are you trying to throw it in someone else's face that doesn't have everything that you have? Shall I praise you in this? He's asking a very rhetorical question because we know the answer to it. And he says, I praise you not. This selfish behavior has no place in the house of the Lord. And so he's saying, didn't y'all, don't y'all have houses? If you want to eat and get gluttonous and you don't want to share, why can't you just do that at your own home? Why would you come together? Uh, corporately as believers and do that in the, plate, in the face of those that are in need, which goes against the very tenet of what Jesus was all about. It was all about selfish or selfless love. Love, he, he always had compassion uh, for others. So Paul asked the question, shall I praise you for what you're doing? Uh, you know, it's all right. It's all right. At least we're doing the Lord's Supper. It's okay. Shall I praise you? He says, no, of course not. He says, I praise you not. And brothers and sisters, we have to be very cognizant of, oh, it's okay. It's okay. We're at least we're doing it. Yeah, we're not very reverent. And yeah, we want to have fun and everything like that. But at least we're doing it. We're making it fun. Well, let me tell y'all something. And I, I don't, I, I'm not very old, I don't think. But going to the cross of Calvary wasn't fun. You don't see Jesus smiling and playing on the cross of Calvary. And if you are a true believer and you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you know that that was not a fun time. It wasn't fun in games. And so the Lord's Supper was not fun in games. Jesus was headed to the cross to die for the sins of this world. So the least that we could do is be reverent when we come to the Lord's table. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's a reminder as you go out and you tell the people in your Sunday school. And I thank God I'm hearing that there are other Sunday school teachers that watch this. And I'm humbled by that. I'm very humbled uh, that, that other Sunday school and other churches are utilizing our videos. Uh, and, 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 you know, and, and so we ought to remind our churches, remind our other Sunday school members that we ought to be reverent. You know, even if we did the Lord's Supper every day. It should be done in a very reverent manner because it's symbolic of what happened to Jesus Christ's body on the cross. Let me see if I can speed this along. Verse 23, for I received of the Lord. I, this, this, this passage just sends chills down my spine. Uh, we used to, 
I don't, we used to read this uh, every first Sunday night. And of course, because of COVID, we kind of uh, done our uh, Lord's Supper now in the morning and nothing wrong with that, of course. Uh, but I just remember hearing uh, Reverend Jonathan and other preachers would read this every Sunday night. And this passage just, just, just sends uh, chills down my spine. Paul's talking to him. He says, for I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. I got this straight revelation from the Lord and I'm de I've delivered this unto you that the Lord Jesus, the same night. What is the night that he was talking about in which he was betrayed the same night? Remember, we covered this a few weeks ago where we were going through the book of John. When he, he took time, he said on this same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, bread being symbolic of his body. Paul was present. Paul was not, let, let me get that correct. Paul was not present when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, but he learned about it through direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Now, this could have happened on one of the occasions that the Lord revealed himself. You can check Acts chapter 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, y'all know that that scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, or even Galatians chapter 1 and chapter 2, if you want to see references. Now, we don't know when it happened, but he received it from the Lord. Then he says that the Lord Jesus, that same night, the night of his betrayal, he took bread. Judas, who had betrayed Jesus, had left the upper room before Jesus instituted the observance of the Lord's Supper. Yes, he was a part of the original meal, but that Lord's Supper, that was something altogether special. Yeah, Judas, like I said earlier, I'll wash your feet, but you're not going to be a part of this. He said he took he took bread. As the, uh, the Gospels teach us, the Lord's Supper was instituted during the Last Supper, which was actually the Jewish Passover. And so this happened on the very night Jesus was betrayed. Verse 24 says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is symbolic. This is my body, not actually my body. Amen. This is symbolic, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Why should I be reverent? Why should I be very respectful of the Lord's Supper and its institution? I should do that because I'm doing it in remembrance of Jesus Christ and what he did for me on Calvary. If there's any reason, if there's any reason why I should be reverent and I should be respectful, it's because this reminds me of what happened on Calvary. Now, I do know that we all sin and we have our moments and, and there are some times and we're about to talk about what that looks like, but it's very important that when we're taking this, that we take it very seriously. This is not uh, just like going to vote. Oh, I'm going to go vote. This is not uh, going to the grocery store, checking off a checklist. This is re in remembrance of Jesus Christ and what he did. Verse 25 says, after the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. After this same manner would mean likewise or in the same way. Jesus did the same with the cup. He gave thanks. And as he did so, he took the cup from the table, blessed it and gave it to his disciples. Now the gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke all agree that the bread came before the cup and that the procedure was the same for both. Their drinking from the cup was also an act of communion or fellowship that uh, at that time, of course, they had a shared uh, cup. And he says that this is, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Now, the cup symbolized Christ's blood that was shed on the cross. And so this blood was symbolic of the New Testament, this New Testament or this new covenant. Now, of course, Israel was the originator. They received the original covenant. But that was as good as the law could take them. What we have now is grace under the blood of Jesus Christ. And you ought to say amen right there. And he says that this is the shedding. This is the shedding of my blood. This is symbolic. No, I'm not drinking. Amen. I think it's Sunday school so we can say it. No, I'm not drinking Jesus's blood. No, guys. Come on now. Let's 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 use a little biblical common sense too. I'm not drinking God's blood. It's symbolic of his shed blood. 
And so he goes on and he says, this do as often as ye drink it, do this in remembrance of me. That's why we do it. That's why we do it with reverence. Verse 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. And so show it's announced, it's a proclamation as often as I do it, whether you're doing it once a week, I know churches that do it, nothing wrong with it. You do it once a day. If you do it once a month, which most of your churches do it on the first Sunday of the month, nowhere in the Bible does it say it has to be on the first Sunday of the month. No one ever said that, right? But as often as you do it, you are supposed to do it and you're proclaiming, you're showing forth his death. Whenever we celebrate the Lord's table, we are proclaiming the Lord's death till he come. In other words, whenever the Lord's supper is observed, it is a visible proclamation of Christ's sacrificial death. This proclamation is to be made until Jesus returns. In other words, it's very important that we observe the Lord's supper. Verse 27, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now notice what he says. Unworthily does not mean unworthy. Y'all catch that. Wherefore, whosoever, so whoever, and it should be those that believe in Jesus Christ. Should remember, because he's talking to Christians. You remember when we're, when we're reading the book of 1 Corinthians, we're talking about Christians. We're talking about Christian issues, believer issues, right? So whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily uh, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Unworthily does not mean unworthy because guess what? News flash, and this is for me too. We're all unworthy. What do you mean? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. We're all unworthy, but there's a different uh, tone and a different understanding to do things unworthily. We're all unworthy, but when I approach, so it's not about my position, it's about my approach. My approach uh, 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 to communion, it means that I have not come to the Lord's table or to the Lord's Supper with a prepared heart and a prepared mind, recognizing the true meaning of the Lord's Supper. In other words, in other words, when I come to the Lord's Supper, I should come with humility. I should come knowing I'm unworthy. I should come with my heart and mind fixed on Jesus Christ. If my heart and mind, and listen to me, brothers and sisters, if my heart and mind is not fixed on the finished work of Jesus Christ, then honestly, and y'all may not like this, but it would not be best for me to partake of the Lord's Supper. This is serious business. Our hearts and minds should be fixed on the death of Jesus Christ for our sins, not trying to be better than anyone, not trying to put someone down, not coming there with unconfessed thoughts and sins in my life. In other words, when I come to the Lord's table, it's serious business. And just a news flash for everyone, whether you're taking it at home or whether you're taking it at church, you should still have the same level of reverence. And I'm not going to get into it, but uh, I'll just leave it at that. We should have the same level of reverence because when you're participating, you should have an attitude of gratitude and humility and reverence for the Lord's table. Verse 28, but let a man. So a lot of y'all probably heard that if you listen to this and you say, man, he getting all over our, getting all over our uh, toes today. Uh, he has no right to talk to us. Well, Paul says it like this, verse 28, examine yourself. I'm just giving you what I believe is good commentary based on the word of God. Verse 28 says, you be the judge for yourself. I'm not going to judge you because I'm unworthy just like you. I got to make sure my heart and mind, and there's been times, brothers and sisters, where my heart and mind were, were not fixed on Jesus Christ. And so I took the Lord's Supper and that, with unconfessed sin. I took it unworthily. Not that I, I'm unworthy, but I took it in an unworthily manner, mad at someone else. I, when I'm mad at someone else, I can't focus on the goodness of the Lord and what he did for me in Calvary. And so that's what he's saying. But here's here's the thing. Here's a qualifier. Examine yourself 
and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. You be the judge for yourself. Let something or someone, you be your own approval. And then that's just the way the Lord is. That's just the way he is. He says, examine, test your own motives. You know, I can go further, you know, because a lot of traditions that we have uh, brought on in our churches and we got to be careful. Am, am I there for show just to see who can do this and do that during the Lord's Supper? Or do I have an attitude of humility and focus on the finished work of Jesus Christ? Verse 29, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, meaning the approach in which I'm doing it, he eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Damnation uh, means judgment. Now, this does not mean that our salvation is taken away. Remember, when you're saved, you're always saved. And, and, and we ought to believe that because the Bible doesn't give qualifications on anything other than that. So what it says is the results of this and taking it in an unworthily manner would be that there would be possible judgment. Now, of course, the Lord does what he wants her to do. Remember that old saying, he's God all by himself. He don't need my help. God works in mysterious ways. It's one is to perform. So this judgment, is it, it could be thought of as disciplinary action. When you take of the Lord's Supper in an unworthily matter, this can mean disciplinary action because why you're not discerning the Lord's body. You're not showing respect. You're not showing respect. It's a failure to reflect on the Lord's death as you commune with your brothers or your sisters. Verse 30 says, for this cause many are weak. For this cause, for this reason, or for this is the why. There were probably those, he says that there were many that were weak and sickly among you and many sleep. He says that this is, might have been, uh, whether you want to believe it or not, Paul said that for this cause or for this reason, why many of them was because of their e irreverent, uh, the and, and just their lack of reverence and their lack of reverent attitude when they were sharing in the Lord's table. He says, this is the reason why many believers were experiencing maybe a lack of physical strength through sickness, and some might have even died that approached the Lord's table in an unworthily manner, their approach. And he says the word sleep would even mean the speech of death. And so he's saying this is this is what God had no doubt made he brought judgment on a few of these believers. Now, thank God through grace, they're saved. But, you know, God, uh, he, he works in mysterious ways and it's his, his, his prerogative how he wants to deal with people that are not reverent toward, not reverent toward him. And he says, this is the reason. This is the reason, verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If we would examine ourselves, if we would uh, discern within our own selves and check ourselves as the preceding uh, verse said, then we wouldn't have need to be judged. In other words, it's, it's very important, brothers and sisters, and the same God that spoke through the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit to the Apostle Paul in chapter 11 is the same God of today. And we have to be very careful, especially in the time, and this is really all year long, but we're now coming upon the time of Palm Sunday and, and Easter Sunday. It, it, it's very important. I think we're, we're this is Palm Sunday that we're speaking of right now. And so it's very important that we remember this and we are very reverent about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened, we're disciplined of the Lord that we should not be condemned uh, with the world. In other words, we are, we are chastened uh, uh, of the Lord. We are judged, we are chastened, we are disciplined by the Lord that we wouldn't be condemned with the world. See, the world are those who fail to accept Jesus Christ are condemned. So in other words, Jesus expects more out of his children or even God expects more out of his children because we're not going to be condemned with the world. So that's why we have to be chastened. He expects his children to act right. And so when you come to the Lord's table, you ought to act right. Should be no foolishness. Amen. At the Lord's table, since Christians are saved and they belong to God, when we fail to worship in a worthy manner, then this displeases God and he deserves the right uh, to chasten us. God's actions and his chastening is up to him, but he deserves the right. Verse 33, as we continue, as we end our lesson, wherefore, my brethren, uh, when ye come together to eat, 
tarry one for another. So the words when you come together to eat probably talks about the love feast that they were talking about. As we talked about earlier, uh, talking about that love feast, that preceding of the Lord's Supper. And so he says, when you come together to eat, no doubt, most likely at the Lord's Supper, he says, tarry one for another. He urged his readers to be considerate of each other when they came together. Be very considerate because what you're doing in, in this preceding is you're not practicing the different things that I even told you about. Love is definitely not the foundation of your gathering, especially uh, putting Jesus Christ in his rightful place, meaning being the, the focus of your gathering. Love is not the foundation and it's definitely not the focus. So he says, tarry one for another. You ought to be considerate of one another. Verse 34, and I believe that's our last verse. Verse 34, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that he come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. In other words, if they could not wait for others, they should eat at home instead of defiling God's ordinance, the Lord's communion or the Lord's supper. Paul gave his readers these instructions so that they, that ye come not together unto condemnation. If these believers came together with the right attitude and behavior, understanding that the focus should be on the Lord and his finished work, he says uh, that they would avoid incurring God's displeasure and yea, even God's discipline. Paul concluded his instruction saying, and the rest will I set in order. Now this rest might be other problems concerning the Lord's Supper, we don't know, or it may concern any other issues that might uh, be going on. But he says, the rest will I set in order when I come. With the words, when I come, probably refers to a future uh, visit from the Apostle Paul. What can we derive from this? We ought to be grateful that we have the opportunity to remember what the Lord did for us so many years ago. And as a result of remembering, we ought to keep reverence and respect for his gracious gift of salvation. How did he do it? By dying on the cross. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head for you and me he died. That's good news, brothers and sisters, and I'm glad about it. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Sunday morning is at 11 a.m. Join us. Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Join us. God bless you from the Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church family.